Pale Scott here. Online personality test. I have no idea who I am, so I'll just let Google tell me. You have to shout to make a point properly. Yeah. Did you eat anything today? Tylenol. Do you just want to plug and play games? Do I have a face? I won! So you have a video game console, right? Welcome to the club. And you have to plug it into the wall, then plug it into the TV, then plug in a controller, then play it. This isn't plug and play technology. Have you been keeping track of the plugs at play here? I just want to plug something in once, and I'm done, and it has a nose. I wasn't expecting an answer this soon. Plug and play games were the sole reason some bin in my living room's corner had purpose. If you didn't own at least one of these from 02 to 09, did you even exist? These things were the thing back in the 2000s. They came in these big fat boxes and proudly proclaimed, plug it in and play. See, no power adapter or extra controllers were necessary. All you had to do was pop in a couple of batteries and plug this directly into your TV with the yellow and white cables. Or I don't know, they could be forks, I'm colorblind. These things could be anything. Composite cables, one for video and one for sound. And if you're good enough, another one for sound. Once you were done with the setup, you'd flick the switch on the controller and boom! Look at this, no power adapter necessary, it plugs directly into the TV, this is magical. Plug and plays were always charming little distractions, and they were easy gift ideas for kids. They were only like 20 bucks a pop, and you didn't have to think about what game console your kid had, all you had to know was, oh, my son likes circles, this'll do. But many times these plug and play games felt like an excuse to sell subpar games inside of a colorful container. Like, I, I don't want to play this, I want to eat it. The core plug and play brand I remember was by Jax Pacific, but they weren't the first of their kind. The TV Boy from the 90s was the first plug and play many will point towards. It repurposed Atari 2600 games and included over 100 of them in an oval. Technology was evolving and fast. This was more of a bootleg console though. Pretty much all of the games included weren't properly licensed and had their names changed. But what the TV Boy did was not only obtain a cease and desist, but also set the standard for plug and play games in the future. Power them with batteries and utilize older technology. And one of the first ones to do this, legally, was the Activision 10-in-1 by Toy Max in the year 2000. While not 100% confirmed, many do believe this was the first of the modern plug and plays. You have the cables, the logo, the legality, it has it all. This device features 10 Activision classics from the Atari 2600, so you know what that means, it looks like this. Yes, this is the controller you'd associate with the games included on this plug and play, and then this is the plug and play you wouldn't be able to identify in the street. So the on and off switch and reset buttons are on the shoulders, cool, and we have two D-pads, cool, with one acting as the buttons, cool, and the game selection, Cool, this one isn't too great. The design's not ideal, and surprisingly, the games aren't much better. But you gotta give this plug and play credit where credit's due. It started a revolution. Jack Pacific started up their line of plug and play consoles shortly afterwards and truly popularized this kind of stuff, and soon everybody was making them. These were the ones I owned back in the day. You see, I may have had a GameCube and Game Boy Advance, but that didn't mean I wasn't interested in playing worse games. The Atari Plug and Play is modeled directly after the original Atari 2600 joystick, and quite well at that. Everything feels exactly how it should here, and that means it doesn't feel great. But they did a fantastic job recreating the experience of the Atari 2600, and it was my first and best experience with the console's catalog. Technically speaking, these are recreations of the games, not 100% the same as the original 2600 versions, though they were made to be as close as possible. I played a lot of Breakout and Pong and Centipede and tried to understand the context of Yars Revenge as a kid. These games, while well, nothing crazy, were fun enough to warrant untangling this thing from time to time. This device may have been one of the first stepping stones to me liking games nobody gives a shit about anymore. Of course, I brought up previously how it was strange I had so many of these things when I had perfectly working game consoles at hand, but the Atari Plug and Play offered something those consoles didn't the unique controller. You could have just bought an Atari compilation on the Xbox, but are you really playing Atari with this thing? So that's one thing the plug and plays had over traditional game systems. The controllers could be whatever they felt like. Oh, we'll get to this one. The Pac-Man plug and played by Jack Specific. Everybody had this one. Me, Scott, everybody. Five Namco classics at play here. The Pac-Man, Galaxian, Rally X, Dig Dug, and Bosconian. And back in the day, I called this list Pac-Man, Galaxian, Rally X, Dig Dug, and what? This is an all right collection. These games aren't one to one with their arcade originals, but they're better than playing the old NES versions and also better than a bunch of the compilation discs on consoles because here, we have a joystick. Of course, using this now doesn't feel as good as I remember. It feels a little clunky, the stick doesn't feel substantial enough, the unit isn't big enough to really fully use the stick like I would on a real arcade machine, but it was a decent joystick at the time, and all these games are factually more fun with a joystick. Of course, they followed this up with a Miss Pac-Man plug and play, featuring different and better games. Miss Pac-Man, Galaga, Xevious, Mappy, and Pole Position. I got so much mileage out of both of these plug and plays, and this was where my love for the Namco arcade games began. What's interesting about the Miss Pac-Man unit is Pole Position is controlled by twisting the head of the joystick. 
I didn't know that as a kid, and when I tried playing the game, the car would never move. Now, how did I never know that, considering there are multiple signs showing that this is how you control pole position? Oh, hey, it's my friend. I don't know how I didn't realize I had to twist the joystick in pole position. I was just a kid. Leave me alone. I hate my parents. These two were my most played plug and plays, but of course, it's impossible to ignore for much longer. My fourth plug and play was the Etch-A-Sketch plug and play. It never worked. It came with a cartridge. Why? Like the cart came in the box with the plug and play and it was the only cart released for the plug and play. So why make a cartridge slot on the plug and play if there's only one cartridge for it and you could just build the elements of the cartridge on the inside of the plug and play? What the f got your sketch? I don't have this one anymore, so I'll throw the concept of it to the side and make way for my true final plug and play I owned as a kid. Corroded batteries. Wish I would've known about that before making that pact. The SpongeBob SquarePants plug and play. It, of course, isn't a collection of old games, but it kind of is. It features five games made specifically for this unit, and each of them is incredibly similar to another retro classic. I wouldn't consider these to be full-on rip-offs, rather, friendly plagiarism. This game's similar to Breakout, this one's Life Force, this one's Missile Command, this one's Zelda, and this one's Donkey Kong. But strangely, these are all pretty fun time wasters. The controls feel really solid, and I honestly think Bubble Pop in this game is better than Breakout on the Atari Plug and Play. And the stick itself is great. I mean, come on, somebody thought of this. There's a fact for you. But while playing, the stick broke and doesn't register the direction of down. This broke right before playing the Donkey Kong ripoff. It's all the way down there. I can't access it anymore, and all I can possibly do with this Plug and Play now is play Bubble Pop. I'm okay with this. So these were the main ones I owned. <laughs> Wait, actually, I did have an Intellivision one because all nine-year-olds love Intellivision. That was all right, though. I remember the controller feeling really cheap and generic. I mean, this is what an Intellivision controller is, so let's play spot the difference. It seems like various plug-and-plays reused old assets, whether it was games, game design, graphics, sound effects, menus, or even the controller shell itself. Where's the evidence? Well, look no further than RCA TV Joypad console. So this uses the same controller design as my old Intellivision one and just makes me ask, why is there a joystick and a D-pad, and how is this a D-pad? It's more hubcap than D-pad. I would ask why this is necessary for Intellivision games, but who knows, maybe this controller design was tailor-made for RCA TV joypad console. You know, I always associate RCA with TV remotes, so they're one of my top 7,000 candidates for making a good game console. Top 8,000. So I think we covered pretty much the three types of plug and plays. The official old school throwbacks, the licensed kids games that usually ripped off other games gracefully, and then RCA TV Joypad console. This is a collection of cheap, low quality games that have been spread around to various other generic consoles like this. But hey, I mean, if you wanna play Roadstar, don't? There's also Go Bang Animal Pool. That's not a sentence, it was a list. Well, that was my collection of plug and plays as a kid. Kind of. Now these were frequently played by me, which is weird to think about. I mean, pretty much all of these had outdated and subpar graphics, and I always had better quality stuff playable on my actual game consoles. But most of the games included on these things were addictive, high score based titles. Games you could just pop in, play for a bit, and pop out. These were solid games to have on these things, because when you wanted to play them, you just plug it and play. You didn't have to worry about making room on the power outlet or anything. Of course, being battery powered meant more times than not when I'd want to play one of these things, I'd pull it out of storage and go, oh fucking shit, I left this thing on for a month. It kept things simple though. Now, why do all of them require a screwdriver to access the batteries? I don't know, this is a bit of a pain. But hey, there were tons more plug and plays, specifically by Jack Specific. There was Spider-Man, Pinball, Poker, Mortal Kombat, Fantastic Four, Scooby-Doo, Batman, Star Wars, Capcom, Superman, 1 vs. 100, WWE, DreamWorks, I'm forgetting thousands more. But here are just a few more I've picked up recently. Atari's back, and this time with a knob! The Atari Paddle Plug and Play, similar to the joystick, but this time we're replicating the original paddle controller, which allows for smooth as butter movement and games like Pong and Breakout. Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune. See, Wheel of Fortune has an actual wheel. What did you do today? This is a good one, even if it didn't accept my answer for what a slogan might be. The elephant attacks that. It was curiously strong mint. The wheel feels great, and Wheel of Fortune makes a ton of sense as a plug and play. Now, Jeopardy, if you play with three people, you can buzz in as others. It's great. The Disney plug and play features a couple of games based on various Disney characters. Uh, this is most similar to the SpongeBob one. Each game is of a different style. The first one, you have to change the direction of the bridges to make a clear cut path. So I constantly failed at the first level, but afterwards I swept the f floor with Timon to the rescue. We have a Lilo and Stitch platformer, Duck Golf. Huh. No, 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 that can't work. Aladdin's another platformer that feels a bit similar to Aladdin on the Super Nintendo. It might just be because you can throw apples in this one too, but it ends with a very basic puzzle game based on the Lion King. You know, that's two Lion King based games in one whole thing. I don't like how the Disney logo is slanted because I keep thinking that's the top of the device and I accidentally point the joystick in the wrong direction. But hey, these plug and plays always have such fun designs. At least the joystick looks like 
a circle. Well, to quote me at the end of this sentence, there's always an EA Sports one. Yeah, the EA Sports plug and play, shaped like a Sega Genesis controller. It comes with Madden 95, NHL 95, and fingers crossed to moan to the rescue. Damn it. See, I enjoy the fact this exists, but my god. Two sports games from the 90s that stores would pay you to take from them included in a Sega Genesis controller you plug directly into your TV. I like when these plug and plays offer a unique ish games or games with controllers you couldn't get on regular game consoles. This one's a bit too worthless for my liking, but it's kind of neat. But hey, at least it's fairly G-rated. Sure, you can combine the letters from the title screen to spell ass rat, but I'm sure the kids wouldn't notice. So what about a plug and play for the adults? Well, here's World Poker Tour, rated M. Actually, the M rating is a sticker and peeling it off reveals the original rating was E. Well, it's a good thing they reconsidered. Can you imagine kids playing this? I can't, I don't want to imagine the world burning the f down. There's an LCD screen on this unit, and it comes with a bonus DVD. Well, don't mind if I do. The game itself, oh man, it, it reminds me of something. I can't remember. Poker. Poker! The final Jack specific plug and play I have is a Nicktoons one, focused on various Nickelodeon cartoons. It just came in the mail, so let's cut it open and take a. Alright, they can't all be winners. For some reason, Jack shipped this unit with the wires pre-cut. That's unfortunate. This is lame because I actually had an accessory for this specific unit too. A game key. That should show you how popular these devices were. They actually got accessories like this released for them. Game keys were made for specific plug and plays that had cartridge slots. You could buy these and expand the game selection on these things. It's really weird because I thought the entire point of these things was that they were way simpler than game consoles. You didn't have to worry about what game system your kid had. You could just buy them a plug and play and know for a fact they will be able to play it. But then you start releasing game cartridges that work with specific plug and plays and all this one says is that it works with Nickelodeon controllers. I wouldn't be surprised if some moms bought their kids a game key because they had a Nickelodeon plug and play that didn't have a game key slot. Here's a power adapter for Jack specific plug and plays. My god, with the game key and this, this is starting to become a lot more than just plug and play. Jack specific really rolled with the plug and play success for a while, which meant they made some really dumb stuff, but they weren't the only company to not give a shit. Various others made their own plug and plays. For example, Toy Max. They were bought by Jack Pacific. RCA! They stunk. But here we have a Tetris plug and play by Radica. It's your basic Tetris. You have a few different modes, the traditional Tetris theme, solid visuals, two players right out of the box. You can just attach the second controller included. This is hell. This controller is a Abysmal. All they had to do was put a d-pad and a button, but no, they had to make it unique. So you move this block as a joystick to move your piece and twist it to rotate. Not only is this control scheme really lousy for Tetris, the control stick itself is wildly stiff. I don't know why they felt the need to make it like this when they could have easily saved money by using a traditional controller. Hell, even the RCA controller would have been better. How about Crayola Electronic Coloring Book? I don't know why I'm disappointed. TV Wild Adventure Mini Golf. There better not be any ducks or I'm gonna fucking lose it. So this is interesting. It's a motion control golf game. You adjust your shot like this and wave the golf club over the sensor. Problem is, waving anything will register it as a hit. So as long as you keep the sensor covered, your character will constantly putt. Here's another gimmicky one, American Idol Dance Showdown. American Idol, you know, the competition show about singing. Here's a dancing game. It's a blatant clone of Dance Dance Revolution. You get a mat, you lay it out and step on the right errors at the right time. See, it's fine, but I personally feel that plug and plays work best when they supplement what you can do on a home console with unique controllers instead of just offering a version of DDR that a dollar store can sell. So that should give you a pretty good idea as to what the plug and plays were back in the mid 2000s, but that doesn't mean they aren't still readily available today, though I have no idea who's still buying them.
modern plug and play. So most of the ones I see look like this. Big box, white joystick, white buttons, cheap fonts. This company MSI is responsible for a lot of these and their website features Mario fan art. They have never worked with Nintendo. So these are blatantly incredibly cheap. Many of them reuse the same joysticks that already don't feel great to begin with. But for some reason they decided to swap the placements of the joystick and buttons for a few of them. Most of these are just one NES game inside a joystick and they all stink. They work, but they aren't a great way to play these games. And so much about this doesn't make any sense. So you wanted to make a plug and play for people who were nostalgic over Mega Man 2 on the NES? So you put it in a controller absolutely nobody played this game with? Like seriously, why a joystick? Why not something that at least resembles an NES controller? Plus like I said, a lot of these only contain one game. And this Space Invaders one, like seriously, is just Space Invaders. There have been so many other Space Invaders plug and plays before this with multiple games. This one, just Space Invaders. And it's not even that accurate to the arcade version. It's the Famicom version. Who played the Famicom version? Double Dragon. I mean, I will give this the benefit of the doubt. The batteries might be in here a bit wobbly. See, that's a problem with a lot of these units. Graphical problems if the batteries aren't fully in or are starting to go, but God, this looks bad. And it's just Double Dragon 1 on the NES. If you have the joystick, why not have the arcade version instead or include it alongside this? WrestleMania, yeah, just the NES game in the same joystick. Why don't I hear anybody talk about how garbage this company is? But hey, I found this Pac-Man one at Walmart recently. It's actually pretty good. The design may not be the most comfortable and sure, having the wires contained at the bottom with a lid may sound like a good idea, but just ends up making it more complicated to put away because now I have to cram all the wires back in and not lose the lid. But the stick and buttons feel pretty all right and the game selection is pretty solid. It even includes the final level of Pac-Man where it's a full-on unbeatable glitch. It's sort of completely useless, but it's neat to be able to play it as I'm sure most of us haven't gotten 256 levels into Pac-Man. I'm not a fan of having to do a combination of button presses to go back to the menu. I would have just preferred a menu button or something. But this is a solid newer plug and play. Of course, there are these at games products, the blast units. They're wireless controllers connecting to HDMI dongles. A lot of people give at games what for since their quality isn't the greatest, but Man, this is so much better than MSI. Who the hell wakes up and says, I'm okay with these existing? Plug and plays were a product of the mid 2000s and while they're still around, I don't necessarily ever seeing them become nearly as big. They somewhat had a resurgence after Nintendo kickstarted the mini classic console craze. As some people call these little systems plug and play. I retaliate with, look at all these plugs. See, on the surface, these things may seem nothing more than cheap toys with extremely basic games for children. That sentence was finished long ago. I do have a lot of great memories with these things though. And none of them were groundbreaking or anything, but they were fun quick pick-me-ups. Even if the games were incredibly basic, many were actually designed quite well and basing the gameplay off of old school arcade games or just offering old school arcade games to play, I think that gave a lot of young kids a greater appreciation of classic games. Of course, none of these I desperately want to go back to and bring them back today doesn't work. I mean, these worked so well back in the mid 2000s because most TVs had composite inputs on the front. Now with HD TVs, if they even have composite inputs, they're on the back. And even then, plug and plays, most of the time, way more. Hey all, Scott here. Why didn't any of you tell me about pencils? This is great. Consider me a newborn fan. I'm sold. I don't even have to think about the next pencil I buy because I already pre-bought all of them. I should have waited for reviews. New product? Oh, don't mind if I do. If it comes from a company, I love it. You don't need to wait for first impressions or reviews. You can just order something the moment it's announced. It's one of our two rights. Now, does that mean you'll get it the day it releases? You'd think so. Pre-orders, the act of pre-ordering. You'd mostly do this to ensure you get this product the moment it comes out, or at the very least, a copy is reserved for you. Pre-ordering something doesn't always mean you'll get it on launch day. Sometimes shipment delays happen. Rather, it ensures you will in fact get it at some point in your life. Pre-ordering is more for the consumer that just can't wait to buy a product, but they can wait to use it. And in the video game industry, pre-orders are a way of life. This is something that's so frequently done with games. Every single one is up for pre-order, and so many people feel the need to hit that button. Other entertainment fields don't feel nearly as inclined to do this. I mean, you can pre-order a digital movie, but are you really human if you do that? With games, pre-orders are constantly pushed, more so than anything else. Oh, if you're interested in this game, you should pre-order it. If you do, you'll get to add something to a landfill. Listen, I rarely pre-order games. I personally feel like it overcomplicates things rather than simplifies them. Most video games are mass produced. You're not gonna have a hard time finding new Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe on launch day, so if you pre-ordered it, get over there. If that game wasn't available at Best Buy at launch, 
launch, the simulation's crumbling. Plus, with pretty much every major game being released day of digitally, sometimes even before the physical release, there's no worries about stock problems. If you really wanted to play a game at launch and there are no more copies available, you have options. I've just had more problems with pre-orders than I haven't. It all started with my first pre-order ever. Wii Sports Resort, because I couldn't wait to play Wii Sports Bowling on a new disc. So I was at a GameStop and decided, I have $20 and can put this towards my own copy of Wii Sports Resort. That's coming out soon. They'll reserve one just for me, and I'll only have to spend $30 more when the game releases. After the launch date passed, the next time I went to a GameStop, I asked if I could pick up my copy of Wii Sports Resort. They said no, because it was at a different GameStop. I don't think it was too far-fetched to believe these stores could communicate with each other. One pre-order at one GameStop was good at another. So I could have just went to the other GameStop to pick up my pre-order. No, I wanted the game really bad, so I spent all my money on it at the GameStop I was at. And thus, I had to then figure out how to cancel my pre-order at the GameStop I pre-ordered at. Hey, don't blame me. I was young and dumb. It was 2018. You know, I should have just paid for the pre-order in full after buying the game at the other GameStop, so then I wouldn't have been embarrassed in the slightest. I wouldn't have had to walk away from the one without a game and wouldn't have had to cancel my pre-order at the other. I know what you're saying. No man should own that many copies of Wii Sports Resort. So two. Ever since that day, pre-orders have left a bad taste in my mouth. It's like buying something with extra steps. Like I went to Best Buy to buy a laptop. They didn't have the specific one I wanted, but said a nearby store had it in stock. So they said I could purchase the laptop at this Best Buy, then show up to the other Best Buy, tell them what I did, show them my information and pick it up. No, that's just asking for trouble. Like I could do that. Or I could just show up to the other Best Buy and tell them I want that specific laptop and pay for it all right there. They would need to scour the records, find out, oh god, did he buy this at a different store? I don't want to keep my receipts, payment records, and birth certificate around just to pick up Go Vacation on launch day when I can walk into the store and find 50 copies on the shelf. Plus, who wants to tell a cashier, hi, I pre-ordered Go Vacation? Oh, you really care, don't you? Okay, but what about online pre-orders? Pre-order the game on Amazon, you'll get it delivered to you day of. Sure, let's go with that. Don't you want the game the minute it's available? That's why you pre-ordered it? Well, pre-ordering online, you'll get it the day it releases, but UPS usually gets to your house around 4 p.m. if they're quick about it. And then sometimes your order gets delayed a day or two or five, and your order isn't even a game that's a limited edition or anything. How did my copy of Animal Crossing come late? You can build a country out of copies available. But it's all about the worry in your heart. What if you show up to the store and there's no more copies left? You know what the last game I experienced that with? Super Monkey Ball Banana Blitz HD. Hey, do you have any copies left? If you didn't pre-order, sorry, no. Really? To be fair, I mean, I don't really like walking in a store to pre-order something. It just feels weird to go all the way there for something you can't tangibly leave with. What did I accomplish today? I only pre-order things when it's almost absolutely necessary, when there's actual reason to believe it won't be in stock at launch if you don't pre-order. I probably pre-ordered more digital titles because you know what happens at midnight when you pre-order games? You can play them. Mm. I'd rather wait till four. Limited editions, brand new game consoles, these make sense to pre-order. At launch, they're first come first serve. So why did I pre-order Assassin's Creed 4? I needed a new football. The pre-order bonus. What better way to get you to spend $60 early than to promise something worth five? Oh man, if I spend my money now, I'll get bullshit and dog shit. Yeah, companies like their pre-orders because they give a good idea as to how many people are actually interested in the game. Plus, if they follow through with the order, that's paying full price for a game at launch opposed to waiting for a price drop later down the line. But how do you get people to actually pre-order? I got some socks in the car. Let me go through everything I remember pre-ordering and what I got for doing so. Firstly, of course, there was Wii Sports Resort. Why did I get for pre-ordering that? Dignity. Next up, what, like some Amazon purchases? <laughs> Nothing with these. I tried to pre-order Smash Brothers for Wii U at GameStop, the big collector's box with the GameCube controller and adapter, and they said we don't have that version, but we do have pre-orders for the regular game and a third-party GameCube looking controller that only those without hands would use. Yeah, I passed and pre-ordered on Amazon. Uh, guess when I got it? After the shipping delay, Right now. I did finally fulfill 2014 Scott's wishes and found a new copy of the Smash Wii U collector's box. Finally. I really wanted to stick it to that GameStop that said, ooh, sorry, no more pre-orders for that. Though, if you want, we have plenty of Little Big Planet 3 pre-orders left. Okay. Hi, I'm the Black Hokage. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming, or just G4.
Before I moved to LA, I considered calling myself the Florida Hokage, but I don't get day drunk enough. Hi, I'm Kasim G. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming, or just G4. People say I'm the most handsome G4 host, and I've asked both my parents. Hi, my name is Kevin Pereira. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming, <laughs> or just G4. Sometimes, I wonder if my entire life is in a snow globe, inside a YouTube Let's Play. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming, or just G4. My favorite League of Legends character? The sexy one with weird ears. Hi, my name is Avali May. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming, or just G4. My life is like a dating simulator coded by my mortal enemy. My name is Gerard Khalil. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming. Or just G4. Life is a speed run that beats you. You could game with any network that never stopped gaming or just with G4. Can you guys add like the, the Disney? People tell me I look like a young Kurt Cobain played by an average looking sketch comedian. How about this? Splatoon for Wii U launched in May of 2015. I pre-ordered at GameStop because you got a DLC code for Inkling costumes for the Me Fighters and Smash Brothers for Wii U when picking the game up. That was such a fun incentive, I had to do it! Did I use the costumes? What do I look like, somebody who does that? Come on, these costumes were valued at 75 cents, I couldn't pass this deal up. Now if you pre-ordered Splatoon at Target, you got a water gun. Good thing you didn't have to specifically pre-order to buy them. Uh, they were selling them separately at the store as well. Thank God I was out of cups. Honestly, this thing was pretty cheap, but for five extra bucks at Target or just straight up giving away for free with Splatoon, eh. That's kind of cool. It does look like the splatter shot from the game with some very cheap stickers that are bound to wear off since there's gonna be water all over this thing. But this wasn't the only pre-order bonus Target did with Wii U games in 2015. No, we got the Super Mario Maker Puzzle Cube, also available separately for roughly $5. How did they f up a Rubik's Cube? This is using like the cheapest plastic imaginable. Each turn feels like I'm grinding against the rest of the plastic. I can't commend them for doing something cute like this, but I'm sure the people in charge said, we have just enough funds to kinda do a Rubik's Cube. If you can only kinda do a Rubik's Cube, you probably just shouldn't do a Rubik's Cube. Now, I personally pre-ordered my copy of Mario Maker over at GameStop because they were giving out this poster celebrating the 30th anniversary of Super Mario Brothers. I don't know, I don't really put up posters outside of a few key examples, but this one just looked neat, so I thought, eh, I'll pre-order to get that. How about with Twilight Princess HD? At GameStop, I got the soundtrack on CD or some of it, sound selection, so not everything. It's also in this dinky ass cardboard case. So not the full soundtrack, and the case isn't anything to write home about. But to be fair, this is the best pre-order bonus I've gone so far. In terms of excitement, I'm brimming. Of course I pre-ordered the Nintendo Switch when that launched, but I had to wait about a month and a half later to get some plastic bullshit with a pre-order because at Target they did the damn Rubik's Cube again. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Rubik's Cube. They also did some air fresheners. To be honest, I don't think these Target trinkets count as pre-order bonuses, more like a purchase bonuses since you can just buy them at Target for super cheap around the game's launch. But hey, they stink, so that ought to count for something. Ever since, I've been fairly selective with my pre-orders. I got Mario Odyssey at Best Buy, where I got this poster and a collectible coin, the Smash Ultimate controller bundle, which also came with a collectible coin. Man, I, I mean, these are quality little trinkets, but at least with the Rubik's Cubes, I got a good few years out of looking at those complaining. These, there's just not much to them. They're nice little coins, 
so cool, but like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do with these. I haven't personally truly experienced a crazy good pre-order bonus. I think the one everybody points to that was undoubtedly the best of all time was the Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker's pre-order bonus. You got Ocarina of Time plus the all new Master Quest version of the game as a GameCube disc. So you pretty much got an extra game for free by pre-ordering this game, but pretty sweet deal. Pre-order copies of Mario Kart Double Dash contain the fabled bonus disc featuring game demos. They were seriously putting work into their pre-order bonuses back then. So, how did pre-order bonuses look a decade later? A free football for pre-ordering Assassin's Creed 4 at Best Buy. Oh, I was gonna buy a football at Best Buy anyways. I needed a new Assassin's Creed 4. This is perfect timing. A flashlight for pre-ordering Shadow of the Tomb Raider at GameStop. Yes, the inside of the game case is so dark I can't find the game without it. A banana-shaped Wii Remote holder for pre-ordering Donkey Kong Country Returns at GameStop. This Wii Remote is really pissing me off. It's not in something else. Good thing I pre-ordered. 25 extra lives for pre-ordering Sonic Lost World from Amazon. Yeah, that's what got me to pre-order. More lives. Free condoms with infamous second son at GameStop Italy. They'll work or your money back. You got exclusive special moves to perform and Remember Me based on Street Fighter by pre-ordering from Amazon, Best Buy, or Steam. Why lock stuff like that behind pre-orders? Why lock cool gameplay incentives? Well, it's easier than supplying quality merchandise. Gears of War 2's pre-order bonus was an RC car tank for free. You know, Target couldn't even get a Rubik's Cube right. Yeah, think if they tried to give you an RC car instead. That's why we got Thumb Warm merch for Super Street Fighter 4. Lots of these bonuses feel like they're trying to offload excess stuff they have in a warehouse off to consumers. You ever try to leave a GameStop without a pre-order bonus? I have yet to hear somebody who has. I blacked out and woke up owning a keychain. Deus Ex Mankind Divided decided to revolutionize the pre-order experience by offering tiers of pre-orders. You could pick this tier, but you'd have to choose which pre-order bonus you'd want, or you could pick this higher one, but you'd have to choose which bonus you'd want, or you could pay a huge premium to play the game early. But the only way higher tiers would be unlocked was if they got enough pre-order sales. So you had to bug people to pre-order a game, so you had the potential to pay more for your pre-order to potentially get one pre-order bonus or another, but not both. Uh, I'll just take the fucking football. This plan was canceled after negative feedback. I mean, it's just straight up confusing. I mean, sure, I think getting dinky little keychains is sort of lame as a pre-order bonus, but it's harmless. It just doesn't do much to incentivize me to actually pre-order. Rather, they are what the name implies, a bonus is not really an incentive. And it, sometimes these bonuses can be legitimately cool. Art pieces, CDs, posters, of course, they rarely can get amazing like with the Master Quest, but I doubt we'll ever see a pre-order bonus that great ever again. But if anything, some of these modern pre-order bonuses really hit home what I was trying to convey a bit ago. Don't pre-order sh like why? The only reason to actually pre-order something is if you get a benefit from it. Like it will be scarce and you want to make sure you get it. But pre-ordering watchdogs? Why? If it's for a pre-order bonus, I guarantee you that pre-order bonus will be available on eBay in moments for pennies. If everybody gets it for free with a pre-order, then there's absolutely no reason to spend full price on the game that you wouldn't normally spend full price on just to get the pre-order bonus that's worth mere dollars. And then there's the fact that with most games, you don't need to pre-order. They'll be readily available at launch. Pre-ordering the game just adds so many unnecessary steps. You have to show up to GameStop, pre-buy the game, then go away, then come back on launch day, tell them, hey, I pre-ordered the game, show all your info, then pick up the game, compared to just showing up to GameStop on launch day and buying the game. But I have time to kill, so I'm gonna pre-order a pre-order of a game, that's where I get to stand in line to find out where I'll stand in line when it comes to pre-ordering the game, because I'll get this pre-order bonus of this exclusive poster. Hey all Scott here. I'm on life support now. No reason, just felt like it. I've been told the machine I'm hooked up to is doing some pretty great stuff. It's efficient, it's useful, it's made by mad cats. I should probably start proofreading my will. Did you know hands can hold garbage and garbage? Game controllers are fairly understated in the grand scheme of things. I mean, as long as you can reach all the buttons at once, that shouldn't be an issue, right? They are ridiculously important to the gaming experience, but that importance comes at a price. As the years have gone on, official game controllers have risen in cost significantly. We go from the GameCube controller retailing for $19.99 to my scheduled laugh at the Switch Pro controller's price point. <laughs> the prices of game controllers can be absolutely ridiculous, sometimes costing nearly as much as a new game, sometimes costing as much as a new game, more than a new game. $70, man, I found a mattress for that much. I will admit, stuff like the Nintendo Switch Pro controller and DualShock 4 have a lot of random junk thrown into them, and at least kind of explains why the prices are so much higher than controllers in 
in the past. But then the Xbox One controller is pretty much identical to the Xbox 360 controller in terms of features, and it's $65. Did all the money go into giving the thumbsticks tire tracks? Controllers can be expensive. Sure, you can probably make it by with just the one that came bundled with your console, but what if you want to play a local multiplayer game, or what if your controller breaks for some reason? You're going to need an extra controller, and the official ones, those can be pricey. But you always have other options. They give these away with car stereos. Third party controllers, controllers not made by the company who makes the console. You never know what you're gonna get with these things. Since they're made by a company that had nothing to do with the actual console, they don't have to abide by any rules, designs, or legal restrictions, nothing. Sitting here at the dice table, gonna pick up my big dice, cause I'm feeling really nice, and we're singing D20. Uh. D20. That's a one. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really? Now why would you get a third party controller instead of a first party one? Well I can think of a few reasons, but most of the time it's all about the price point. These bad boys would sometimes retail for considerably less than official controllers. You can use that money for new games and your mortgage. However, let's not throw all third party controllers under the bus here, because I consider them to fall under two types, big deals or big gimmicks. Either the controller is cheaper and that's why you'd want it, or it features something the official controllers don't. Like the QuickShot controller for the NES. This isn't supposed to be a replacement controller, it's supposed to be an alternative. If you want to use a joystick with your games, whip out the coffee table, jam the stick with the suction cups, this thing ain't going anywhere. This works well for arcade style games, or stuff like Top Gun if you're one of those people. But in terms of a controller with no real advantages compared to the official controllers outside of price point, the Hanyu Explorer 1 for the NES, literally just another company's version of the NES Advantage. There isn't much reason for you to pick this up other than the fact that it's cheaper than the official official advantage controller. However, this thing has some interesting features. These top two buttons do absolutely nothing, and there's a useless battery compartment. I really have to start using this term better. In the grand scheme of third party controllers, these ain't too bad. Third party controllers were more so gimmicky back in the NES days, mainly because you needed like two standard NES controllers at the very most, so for people to want other controllers, they needed to stand out. They needed to have features the regular controllers didn't have. That called for pretty much any unofficial controller to have turbo buttons, like the Turbo Touch 360 for the Sega Genesis, this gives me chills. We have switches to give any of the buttons turbo fire, but the star of the show here is the lack of a D-pad. I'm sure tons of people who saw this in the store went, yes! You ever just use the Genesis controller and, ah, there's too much D-pad here. Now this, I mean, no D-pad is exactly what I wanted out of a Sega Genesis controller. This is a touchpad and it senses where your thumb is. 
where your thumb is. Yeah, this doesn't work very well. You don't get the precision of an actual D-pad at all. I don't know if this is whacking out because of old age, but I couldn't imagine this ever working that well when it was new. But hey, if you want a more standard experience, here's the Sega Genesis Owl Pad. I'm sure somebody stood by this controller like you're waiting in the living room for your date to come downstairs and you're talking to her dad about how much you like the Sega Genesis controller. We're an Alpad family. The back is a soap dish. Now, if you're looking to buy retro gaming garb these days, you're likely to come across these off-brand controllers. They look pretty similar to the originals, but with a few things altered so Nintendo doesn't have a fucking aneurysm. If there's just a blank space where the Nintendo logo should be, run. These things prey on people looking to buy old systems who need an extra controller. They're usually for sale at retro game shops and look almost identical to the original controllers, but are almost always inferior in every way. Like, come on, $15? That's around the same price for an official N64 controller, but people keep buying these because they look so similar and they're brand new. At least back in the day, third-party companies respected the consumer. To differentiate themselves from the first-party companies, they made sure to add their own stupid twist to their product. Introducing the Boomerang 64. The analog stick fell off of mine and all that's left is a stick, so I had to improvise. Now, this isn't nearly as bad as it may seem. It is a chunk fest in my hands, but it gives you an N64 controller with a slightly more conventional layout. It has built-in rumble if you slide some AAAs in, and there are two whole Z buttons for maximum but the D-pad is stiff, the L and R buttons are in totally out there locations, and overall, it's just an awkward controller. Also, the name is a lie. The SuperPad 64, now this screams, oh, Go oh, I need a Nintendo 64 controller and only have $10. I'm gonna be saying that on my wedding night. It's a substitute, but that's all it really is. It doesn't excel at anything in comparison to the original. I mean, yeah, this isn't great, but I'm used to how not great it is. The SuperPad 64 just feels weird without those grips on the sides. It feels incomplete. Z feels like a gas station fuel button. The SuperPad 64 is the type of thing I think of first when I hear the term third-party controller. Cheaper in every sense of the word. But this was made by Performance. The company I immediately think of when I hear the term third-party controller is Mad Cats. If you walk into a building constructed by Mad Cats, get the out of there. Get all the kids out of the room. Three, two, one, Jesus Christ, censor that. The only Mad Cats product I own legitimately without thinking twice about it being made by Mad Cats was my GameCube memory card, and I'm still happy to have it on me. Look at all these memories, an entire page of Nickelodeon game save files. I love gaming, but look at this, 16X, whatever the hell that means, keep it coming. I had so much storage space on this card. Mad Cats was never the worst supplier of controllers, but they were definitely known for their mediocrity. But I mean, come on, has a company who made a Dallas Cowboys PS2 controller ever steer you wrong? A lot of their controllers aren't terrible, but they're on their way up there. The Mad Cat's GameCube controller, talk about undercompensation. You take a regular GameCube controller and then just warp every element of the controller until it's a shrunken, grotesque GameCube pad. Oh, and bold up the fonts on the buttons. Just by looking at this thing, there is something undeniably cheap about it. Like many of these controllers, it works, but so does filing for bankruptcy, so whatever. Different people like different things. Well, what about the Mad Cat's arcade stick for the Xbox 360? With all the arcade titles available on the 360, you needed a good arcade stick to play them with. I still need a good arcade stick to play them with. This controller is all show, no go. You look at it and go, wow, this is everything a regular Xbox 360 controller is, but with controllers tailored for arcade games. A joystick with a fire button on top, a spinner for games like Arkanoid, this is gonna end in heartbreak. This is just a regular thumbstick on stilts. It has such a wide range of movement. Most arcade joysticks are locked in a set number of directions. Here you have full 360 degree movement, which let me tell you now, this does not work well for Ms. Pac-Man. The entire controller itself is too tiny, like you I want to be able to slam an arcade controller on a coffee table and not have to worry about it moving all over the place. No, this one's too small and light to set down and play with, but it's too big and cumbersome to hold in your hands. This has a lot of the same problems as the Atari 2600 joystick in terms of size. I can't say Mad Cats didn't try with this controller, but they didn't. But want to know who did try with their controller? Nickelodeon. Put SpongeBob in your hands. SpongeBob controllers for the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. I remember advertisements for these, and yep, it is SpongeBob in your hands. It's a good Wednesday night controller. I'm not gonna use it all the time, but one day a week I'm good with. You get a lot of these novelty controllers made by third parties, like a Dallas Cowboys controller, damn it. Now, you can't go talking novelty controllers without bringing up Afterglow. Yeah, I was 16 at some point. This interests me. An Afterglow Wii remote, transparent in all the right ways. Lock some batteries in, sync it up, and that is fairly disappointing. They move some button placements around, like 
the 1 and 2 buttons are at an angle, that's sort of annoying. Plus and minus are right next to the A button, honestly, a pretty okay change. But then the home button was moved all the way to the top, and you need a damn toothpick to hit it. Well, why sit here and whine when we can whine with even more style? A rock candy nunchuck. Finally a controller that answers my lucid dreams. The nunchuck finally has an ass. It's transparent plastic as well, but because of that, we get to see some of the iffy looking wire in here. That doesn't look too good. If this doesn't scream playing Goosebumps Horrorland, I don't know what does. Now, what if you're playing Xbox 360 and your hands start to bleed? Well, damn, you don't want to stop playing to dry the blood off. So introducing Airflow, the controller with a fan. You hit this button and the fan turns on. Well, that checks out. This is a very standard wired Xbox 360 controller, but with LEDs and a fan with two different speeds. Honestly, it's good at what it does. If you're really hankering for a controller with a fan, you can do a whole lot worse than Airflow. Speaking of good third-party controllers, the Logitech Wireless PS2 controller. Oh my god, this thing is really comfortable. Dare I say, more comfortable and sturdier than the official controller. The traditional PlayStation 1, 2, and 3 controllers just aren't really my thing, but this pucks it up a bit and just melts in my hands. Also, I like the blue underneath the analog sticks. Those are fun. Here we have a few controllers for the Nintendo Switch. First up is the 8-Bit Do SN30 Pro. I've always heard a lot about 8-Bit Do, Do, damn whatever. They specialize in retro-esque Bluetooth controllers. This one obviously takes heavy inspiration from the SNES. And yeah, it's pretty good at what it sets out to do. I don't see this as a full-on Switch Pro controller replacement, but as a supplemental controller for 2D platformers or retro stuff, then oh yeah, it's good. It also works on PC, Android, and irrelevant, so there are a ton of uses for this thing. But what about a controller made specifically for the Nintendo Switch? Well, just your luck, here's the Power A wireless controller. Themed after The Legend of Zelda, specifically with some Twilight Princess art, it's okay, I mean, it's perfectly fine. It has motion controls, you also get these buttons on the back you can map any of the other buttons to. However, you don't get HD Rumble or NFC here. For that, you need to chalk up an extra 20 bucks for the official Pro Controller, that's not worth it. The extra money may not be worth what the Pro Controller adds in terms of features, but I will say the extra 20 bucks is worth the more premium feeling of the Pro Controller. This is perfectly fine, it does the job, but at 50 bucks for a third party controller, I'd just bring for a Pro Controller at that point. Here I have a bunch of PS3 controllers. All right, first up, this is the GameStop branded one. That feels all right, let me test out the trigger. Oh my God. The tier one wired PS3 controller, pretty much just like an Xbox One controller. The X got rubbed off here. <laughs> that means somebody must have used this thing. Rock Andy strikes again, this time with this tiny PS3 controller. This feels like something I get out of a capsule machine. Let me rewind a bit to the PS2, the TTX Tech Wireless Controller. I see they had to make sure the button symbols were different enough to avoid copyright problems with Sony. What are you talking about? That's not a PlayStation X, that's a Norse symbol. It's feeling like one of those B-Bon Cool kind of days, you know? Here's the B-Bon Cool for the Nintendo Switch. This hurts. Everything just doesn't feel right. These triggers, the sticks, the D-pad. No. Okay, I've never bought into third-party controllers before because you are almost never going to get the same experience or quality than from the first-party offerings. Sure, some stand out, but 90% of the time, you're asking for trouble buying these things. Oh wow, a Nyko controller. Might as well be saying, oh wow, I can't just buy a pre-owned first-party controller or save up just a little more for the official one. Sure, some of them have their place in the market, but time and time again, I just ask myself, why do most of these exist? And on top of that, Mad Cat's pulled a fast one on me. This isn't a life support machine. This was just a bread box. Five bread sticks, four my triple treat, three layers deep, ten cinnabon mini rolls to eat, and the pizza plus another pizza. The triple treat box only from Pizza Hut. At Steel Series, we make the headsets, mice, and keyboards that the world's best gamers win the most with. And we've been doing it since way back. It's up to you how far you go, but whatever you do, go for glory. What's the recipe for surprising the kids, treating yourself, and ditching dish duty? You're looking at it. Order your Pizza Hut faves like original pan, original stuffed crust, and more at PizzaHut.com. No one out pizzas the hut.
Hey y'all, Scott here, and I've just been promoted at my job to the title of stay-at-home son. <laughs> Suffice to say, I've had a lot of extra time on my hands, and I've been discovering the legends of lost video games. Someone please hire me. Games are a medium in which preservation can be tricky, thus some games can't be played in their original state. These are games that have basically been lost, not games that were cancelled, but games that existed and were playable, but are inaccessible nowadays. These are the games that time forgot. NBA Elite 11, a crowning achievement in the cancelled but not cancelled industry. EA initially developed Elite 11 as a reboot of the NBA Live series. After a lame demo was put out for the game showcasing various problems and glitches, EA realized the product just wasn't up to snuff and thus cancelled the release of the game. Or did they? Copies of the game were shipped to retailers, but EA requested them to be sent back. Most obliged, but some copies were sold to consumers. Due to never officially releasing, but technically officially releasing, NBA Elite 11 is incredibly hard to play. If you want to grab the game, well, the demo that initially released was completely ripped from online stores, making this one of the hardest EA Sports games to experience, thank god you made the cut. Hey, remember download play on the Nintendo DS? It was a way for you to temporarily download content from another DS without an internet connection, mainly for things like playing a multiplayer game without your own copy of the game. It's pretty slick. But you could also get exclusive demos by using download play in specific areas like retail stores. However, we have an exclusive game that was only available via DS download play. Visiting the Poke Park, a Pokemon theme park in Japan, you can download an exclusive DS game to your system, Poke Park Asari Takai DS. It's a Pokemon fishing game, that's it. The way DS Download Play works is that after your system is shut down, or after 12 hours, the game is inaccessible. And the fact that this game was only available in a theme park that's totally dead now, Pokemon's triumphant leap into the fishing genre just refuses to be played nowadays. Here's a plethora of games that were delivered via online services in the early 90s back when the internet was delivered via railroads or whatever. Yes, various game systems in this era kinda sorta supported online, but in different ways compared to how online support is handled nowadays. The Satellaview and Sega Channel were online services for the Super Famicom and Sega Genesis respectively. The Satellaview was more of a satellite broadcast modem offering games to be played at specific times almost like the game through a radio broadcast you had to tune into. In fact, the way the games were delivered was basically like a radio broadcast. The games offered on the service varied from add-ons, to remakes, to remixes of previous games, to just full-on new games. But this method of games delivery came with a caveat. Most, if not all, of these games would not officially be re-released in any physical way, and thus fans had to step up to ensure these games could be played for generations to come by backing up the files online. The only way to get these games legitimately nowadays is to grab a Satellaview with the cartridge and memory pack, hopefully with previously broadcasted game data on it. A good majority of the Satellaview broadcasted games can be played now via emulators, and unofficial reproduction cartridges exist of various games, but many are not in their original state. For example, an expansion to The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past was released, entitled Ancient Stone Tablets, and featured a narrator speaking to the player alongside orchestrated music being streamed. While Ancient Stone Tablets can be played on an emulator nowadays, it's never been officially re-released by Nintendo, and the narrator and orchestrated music is completely lost. Another one is Kirby's Toy Box, a collection of games broadcasted via this service. They were minigames, basically an expansion of Kirby Superstar. Most of the minigames have been found, backed up, and can be played online right now, except for one. The game entitled Ball Rally is still lost and can't be played unless you just so happen to have a Satellaview with the game on it, which is something that has yet to surface. Just a few years ago, a good chunk of the Kirby's Toy Box games that were believed to be lost did end up surfacing, so don't completely count this one out just yet. But, get ready for the most heart-wrenching lost game broadcast of them all. Garfield Caught in the Axe Lost Levels The Sega Channel for Sega Genesis was kind of Sega's version of the Satellaview, and similar to it, Sega offered some exclusive games on the service like Mega Man The Wily Wars and Alien Soldier. Garfield Caught in the Act was offered to play, but also saw release as a physical cartridge. 
However, a handful of levels didn't make the cut in the final release and were finished for the Sega Channel version of the game. Many have nicknamed this as Garfield the Lost Levels, as they are completely lost. However, these levels are available on the Game Gear and PC versions of the game. It's not confirmed, but it's safe to assume that while these versions may be similar, they probably aren't one-to-one -one the same level designs as the levels on the Sega Channel version, which are gone and will most likely never resurface. No. The dependency many games have on online stores scares the piss out of me. So many games are digital only and can be taken off of the stores at any moment, making it almost impossible to play them. A good amount of the time, these games are taken off for licensing reasons. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World The Game is a huge one that was taken off Xbox Live Arcade and the PlayStation Network. Being a retro-style beat-em-up based on the movie based on the graphic novels, this one has gained quite a following, so it's sad to see you can't play it anymore if you want to. Turtles in Time Reshelled was a reimagining of the arcade and SNES classic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time, and yikes, I don't think a ton of people dug this one, so who cares that it's gone? The Simpsons arcade game was removed from XBLA and PSN, and that was already a game people were having a hard time getting a hold of to play. It was a bit of a miracle to see the game re-released on these platforms at all, so at least it did happen, even though it was short-lived. Nintendo specifically did this with the enhanced re-release of The Legend of Zelda Four Swords on DSiWare to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Zelda series. It was always positioned as a free, limited release, and it's been unavailable for years at this point. One of the most infamous delistings in recent memory, P.T., a free playable teaser for the cancelled horror game Silent Hills. After the game's director Hideo Kojima and publisher Konami had a falling out, not only was Silent Hills cancelled, but P.T. was just absolutely eviscerated off the PlayStation Store. The only way you can play it today is if you still have it downloaded on your PlayStation 4, and even then, if you delete it, you can't even re-download it. Mario Roulette is an incredibly rare and obscure Japanese arcade game released by Konami. It's basically what it sounds like, a Mario Roulette featuring similar graphics to those found in the bonus stages from Super Mario World, but the only way you can play it today is if you find one. And spoilers, Jesus Christ, that's never going to happen, this is such an obscure rare release that not only is it nearly impossible to find, but even more difficult to back up online because, you know, it's never happened. The online multiplayer component of many games have been shut down. Looking at the games using the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection on the Wii and DS, multiplayer's donezo on a lot of those titles, but massive multiplayer online games are completely toast. When those things are shut down, it's completely game over. Many games are kept alive via fan servers, but more times than not, MMOs that die, die forever. It isn't always apparent just how fragile media can be. The Film Foundation estimated that over 90% of films before 1929 have been lost forever, which is way past unfortunate. That's history right there that never got justifiably preserved. Of course, with film, books, music, and the sort, these forms of media can be displayed and preserved in a multitude of ways now. Video games are a different story. Games are dependent on the hardware in which they were designed for. Movies, music, and books don't have that problem. They're all generally in formats that can be displayed on any computer, or any DVD, or CD, or just pieces of paper. Games are trickier. The fact that they're designed for specific hardware in mind makes it more difficult to preserve. Many point to emulation, which of course emulates a specific video game console on different hardware, and yes, that's an excellent way to preserve games, especially and in my opinion, preferably when it's officially endorsed by the companies who originally made the game. Recent releases like the Mega Man Legacy collections are emulations of some classics, which many purists may scoff at, but in my opinion, if they play and look as they should, I commend re-releases like this, as it ensures that these games are readily available to play and won't be lost to history. But of course, not everything can be preserved, and we just have to live with that. I would love to get my hands on a lot of these games someday, but I'm not giving my hopes up. Honestly, the fact that some of these games are lost to history makes them more interesting in some cases, and potentially gives them more notoriety than if they were readily available. But it still would be nice to have hard copies of all these games. Of course, when talking about games that are lost and can't be played anymore, everybody has to mention Club Penguin, an online game where you just bro out with other people all displayed as penguins. You see, I never played Club Penguin, I was always more of a Nictropolis guy, which suffered the same fate. Well, with these online chat room kids games gone forever, I guess I'm gonna have to relive what it's like to be a kid in one of these things by just going to a chat room and posing as a 12 year old. Gotta ask this person how old they are these days first off, and with the age old age question being thrown out there, I think I'm gonna leave it at young. 18? Get out of here. Think young, go younger. Don't worry guys, we're in an online chat room. These people are wholesome with a capital H. Scratch that.